We can open a moment of questions and observation, uh, and after we continue with uh, Pierre Paolo Donat. I mean, please, there are some questions, some observation about the things that say uh, Belitz. I have a question. We, the, these uh, robots, um, what kind of consideration we can have? Because we say the human being is image of God, but these robots, what kind of image are image of, of what? Because uh, someone also in the academy last time put the question that the robots could be our friends. So this, what is this question? Are, could be our friends or not? No, because St. Thomas Aquinas say that about the sacraments, that the sacraments of God, for the grace of God, used things of the matter, but can give something to the spirit. So the robots can stimulate the spirit of the human being or not, it is the question. About two, two years ago, we organized a seminar with one of the most important experts in the world about robots and new professions, Professor Peter Saskin. And he, he told us that there is two ways of competing with robots. Uh, one way if, is to compete in that skills that robots ca cannot provide us, like emotional intelligence, conscience, and soft skills. And the other way of competing, competing with them is to build them, to construct them <laughs> with hard skills, computer, mathematics, and hard social science. Um, but robots, of course, are our uh, uh, competitors in many ways, but also uh, we have to be uh, clever enough to be able to compete with them in that areas that they are not able to, to do it. Mainly soft skills. Question? More observation. Marcelo Suarez, do you have something to say? For your uh, for your reflections, um, in the field of uh, um, of education, as it pertains to the nature of human labor and the practice of democratic citizenship, uh, there is an increasing focus on socio-emotional development and the uniquely human socio-emotional uh, skills that may or may not be easily transferable to in the world of uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, computer-assisted uh, design, uh, and the like. Uh, you mentioned the crisis of education, uh, especially in Latin America. Uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about the, the, the skills that will be required before making the entry into the uh, global economy as uh, uh, demarcated by uh, the, the, digital, uh, the digital labor might, uh, might be. And if you were to prioritize the skills, the competencies, the sensibilities, the habits of the heart that would be required to humanely, to intelligently, to ethically engage, artificial intelligence, uh, what would some of those priorities in, in your uh, estimation be? I, I, I find that there is a lack of conscience, of lack of awareness among the Latin American people regarding the need of further education. For example, in, in the last three years, we have been conducting a public opinion survey through Latino Barometro uh, over 
um, 19 countries and including more than 60,000 people. And we found astonishing conclusion in that um, public opinion because, for example, um, people who have only primary education, more than 60, uh, of almost 60% of that people consider that they have enough skills and they have enough education to face the new challenges of, of technology regarding their jobs. So they don't consider that they, they have a gap in the education, educational system and, and they, they consider themselves well equipped to face that challenge. Uh, so that, that's a, a very important problem because uh, the lack of awareness among uh, the poorest is also uh, deeper. So th that's a, a very important point. And uh, on the other hand, the, there is a panic attack because more than 70% of people consider that the, job, the robots will be taking their jobs in the next future. And they are not uh, ready to, to drive uh, an, an autonomous car, they are not um, ready to eat artificial meat, they are not ready to take um, doctor consultation through internet, but they are, they are facing a, a paradox between the increasing level of technology and the lack of um, proper education and proper uh, skills to, to face that challenge. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your introduction. Uh, I totally agree on the scenario that you gave, uh, but I think that we have to, to make it a little bit larger in the sense that we are facing something that we can define a uh, changing of age in the sense that uh, AI and data, data approach to labor is producing a shift that is more similar to the one that telescopy with Galileo made. Everything is, is transforming from fact to ante anticipation of fact through a cognitive system. And looking, focusing on, uh, on the work and on the labor, uh, the first things that I, I would like to underline is that more than robot is the algorithm inside the working process that has the most powerful impact. We are producing something that we can define a new social actor that is not a human being, that is not a corporation, but is uh, a, a, the algorithm that is not transparent, but is really effective in determining the labor, the labor market. Uh, every day, much more in the Western, algorithms are the bosses of people that work. And that produces a huge transformation, because if before entering inside the job place, inside the place of work, I can imagine myself with a career. Now I, I cannot take the place on any server or any SAP system up myself. More than that, uh, because this new model, it's a, a global sworn model. There is an offer and globally, digitally, everyone run to take the job. What's happening is that a lot of, uh, of worker saw the price of higher income. So now, for example, with these delivery tools, we can give to a, in a Western country uh, to someone 3,000 euro a month if you work well. And the idea that I can achieve much, much more money make people much easier to give away the right of labor in exchange of this kind of, of uh, realize yourself. It's much more an individual model than a global one. And because I can achieve much more for myself, I push myself to work in that model beating on myself, giving away a social right or something else. Uh, and then my biggest fear is that uh, this kind of form of digital capitalism can do to the human being working on his data, like you said, what the worst capitalism in the last century made with nature and uh, resources. So the, the human being that produce data, the ability to have a prediction on the behavior of the human being is the new asset that a form of capitalism can simple try to use and to change a lot the dignity of the human being. Because once I will be profiled by an algorithm, all my future will be 
in some way written, already written by an algorithm. So this global transformation, before we have some kind of real concrete solution, probably we will we'll change deeply what we understand as labor right, and uh, also he has to reflect in some way in the social doctrine of the church. And what is really positive now is that we can anticipate some of this problem and enlarge, transform, uh, augment the approach that we have in social doctrine to simply anticipate this kind of challenge. Songwan, want to say something? Yeah. Okay. Ah, sorry. Sorry, she said. Please. Yeah, I think that we, like all new developments, there's change and also continuity. I mean, just listening now to Paolo makes me think that if it's the case that uh, we're going to have a situation where people cannot consider a career because they have um, algorithms controlling them and telling them what to do, well, that's what a lot of the population already had to deal with during the Industrial Revolution. You know, the people on the shop floor, the people uh, who had no career prospects. Um, so, in a way, what we're just seeing is a further development of something we already know very well. I think we also need to keep that in mind and not think, in some ways it's new, but in some ways it's very old. Um, there's a very, a very important historian of technology, Lewis Mumford, writing in the 1950s, saying that we always have to remember that there's basically two ways of designing technology, and they're always present in society sometimes one form becomes more dominant than the other. Um, now, he uses terms which are a little bit old for us now. Um, the, the, the form which he says is the oldest form, actually, the form that we find in the Neolithic village, for instance, is what he calls biotechnics, nothing to do with biotechnology. Um, what he means by that is a form of technological development which is inserted in a way of life in which the technology is supporting a way of life. Um, and the other side, which he says the first time we see this is in the building of the pyramids in Egypt. We really see this in, in recorded history anyway. Um, but we see it coming back from time to time, and it certainly came back in the Industrial Revolution, um, is what he calls monotechnics, which is where the machine is at the center. Of course, what's actually happening is that one group of people in society is controlling another group of people in society through the machine. It's not actually the machines that are taking over. Um, and so I think we're seeing another chapter in the history of these two forms of technology struggling with each other. Um, people like me, who trained as engineers initially, uh, we inherited a way of thinking about technological design which is entirely monotechnic because the engineering profession didn't exist before we get the Industrial Revolution and the Industrial Revolution becomes, even though in the early Industrial Revolution you can see different kinds of machines developed, but very quickly what happens is that you get um, huge resources put into developing the monotechnic type machines and they become by far the most productive by far the, and the others just get left, even though at the beginning there's no real technical reason why they couldn't be developed. It's a political economic reason why they're not developed, not a technological reason. Um, so I think this, we're just seeing another chapter in a way in this development. Now it's not exactly the same because we're talking about algorithms, we're talking about um, brain type work that we weren't talking about so much before, we were talking about more manual work. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from history. Uh, in that sense and not be too worried about uh, being unable to cope with this in that sense. People have a lot of fear about this and I think sometimes it suits a technologist to make us feel afraid and we just do what they say. Um, the, other, the last thing I would like to say is that, as we know, what happens in terms of jobs depends a lot on the legal framework. Um, there's the Americans who are doing all these studies saying, you know, we're going to have this U-shape of jobs, that, that the, anybody in the middle, paralegals and all that kind of thing, they're all going to lose their jobs, but we're going to need still the badanti, the, the carers, and we're going to need the very high technology people on the other end. Um, if you look at a study they did in Finland, um, not that long ago, I'd, can't, I'd have to look it up again who did it. They have a quite a different uh, model, quite a different uh, prospect because they say, well, we think certain legal instruments are going to stop this happening. 
So, I mean, I, I think we, we, we need to also factor this in to the discussion. How exactly are we going to deal with this from a legal point of view? Thank you. Remark myself. Um, yes, I've been stimulated by intervention, apart from Belitz, uh, Paolo, and Helen. It seems to me that uh, we are a bit, uh, culturally speaking, behind, because we keep on reading the facts of today's fourth industrial revolution with the same mental categories of the past. <coughs> Why do I so? Because what Paolo said, Father Paolo, no, brother Paolo, uh, is uh, that uh, we really run the risk of entering an age of algocracy, algocracy, where the power is in the uh, algorithm. That is why the implication is that we need to develop an algo ethics. It's not enough to apply an ethic to the person. We have to discuss how, which rules the, those who program and produce algorithms should follow in order to be acceptable. And what uh, Alan said, uh, it's interesting because it seems to me that we are going back to an old dispute at the beginning of the 19th century, at the time of the first industrial revolution. And in those days, there was a big debate among economists and engineers of the time between the school of thought of Adam Smith and that of Charles Babbage, to which David Ricardo and other famous economists adhered. Charles Babbage, and in my opinion, that was the major mistake of David Ricardo. But David Ricardo was a banker, and so he followed an engineer. Babbage was an engineer. Because Babbage says there is no need to send people to work or to study a lot. It's enough they can read and write. Why? Because the division of labor implied by the new techniques are such that even Ill almost illiterate people can perform certain tasks. On the other hand, Adam Smith had written a few decades before just the opposite. He said, just because we are facing a new way of production, we need to invest more and more on the education of workers. But as we know from history, the line of thought of Ricardo and Babbage at the end was the winner. And that is explained. Today, mutatis mutandis, we are facing the same problem. Because some people say, as you correctly said, Gustav, eh, most people believe that it's enough to do primary school in order to cope with the new technology, which is a reminiscent of the Babbage approach. And in my opinion, we should strive to prevent that this will occur. Do you agree? When, when I listen to you, Stefano, I was thinking about the rational choice. <laughs> Are robots able to, to make rational choices? <laughs> That's a problem. Ah, OK, OK. Thank you, Stefano. So uh, we, we keep. Okay. Give the floor to the parliament. 